Welcome to Independent Sources. I'm Vienna Ravinka. And I'm Gary Pierre Pierre. The nation's undocumented immigrants are often called invisible people, shadowy figures that try to avoid detection by authorities who could deport them back to their countries. But last week, three undocumented students emerged from those shadows. They risked their futures in the United States as they refused to budge from Senator John McCain's office and urged the passage of the DREAM Act. On this edition of Independent Sources, we talk about this bill that could be a pathway to citizenship for many children who are brought here illegally by their parents. Why is this law so important that these students would risk deportation to see it enacted? We examine U.S.-Mexico relations as tensions grow along the border because of the Mexican drug war and the recent Arizona bill, SB 1070. And we'll tell you why the second most popular sport in the world is gaining an audience in New York City. We'll have those stories and news of the week when we come back. You have an incredible ability. Uh, to reach and to persuade and to educate and also to make people feel comfort uh, and hope. The recent arrest of four students demanding the passage of the DREAM Act has put the bill back in the headlines and added yet another nuance to the immigration reform debate. Last week's sit-in at Senator John McCain's office was just the latest act of civil disobedience staged by grassroots organizations trying to get the bill back on Congress's agenda. Joining me in studio to discuss the issue is Marisol Ramos and Gabriel Martinez of the New York State Youth Leadership Council. Welcome both. Thank you. Thank you. Before we begin, let's take a look at this report from Michel Garcia, who followed a group of dreamies who are using new media as an organizing tool to pressure lawmakers to pass the DREAM Act. They have covered over 1,000 miles on what they named the Trail of Dreams. I'm just a regular person that, you know, one day decided to fight so that other people, you know, had a voice and also because I wanted a voice as well. They're called dreamies or dreamwalkers on a journey from Miami to make their voices heard in the nation's capital. Their goal, passage of the DREAM Act, the Development Relief and Education for Alien Minors Act that creates a pathway to citizenship for students brought to this country as children, students like them. My name is Felipe Matos and I'm 23 and I was born in Rio, Brazil. Well, my name is Carlos Roa, I'm 22 years old, born in Caracas, Venezuela. Raised my hand in my entire life. They invited the online world to join them on their journey via a multimedia website to witness the challenges it's cold and, wet. and the opposition. It's true, they need to deport all their Mexicans. And their site fits within the new media strategy for the DREAM Act movement, with users urged to sign petitions, given leads on scholarships, and then there's the testimonials which organizers say are meant to encourage undocumented youth to, in their words, come out. My name is Gabriel, and I'm undocumented. It doesn't quite roll off your tongue, but it gets easier every time you say it. Part social networking, part organizing, says Mohammed Abdullahi, via, of course, web video. We could get picked up by immigration anytime. Um, and so being out there and being more public about it, the only thing that creates is a uh, larger community so that if something were to happen to one of us, um, we already have those relationships built up and we could actually do something about it. Immigration officials in a statement say their focus is on immigrants with criminal convictions. Just last week, Mohammed Abdullahi, along with other activists, were detained by immigration officials after conducting a sit-in in Senator John McCain's Arizona office. They now face deportation hearings. The Dreamwalkers arrive in Alexandria, Virginia to considerable media attention. The organizers who are trying to get attention to a topic have become much more savvy about how to use technology, new media, old media, and kind of blend them together, and sometimes showing disproportionate power influence presence. He says looking closely at who takes action offline is a good gauge of impact. I live in Dalton, Georgia now. I moved there and there's a huge Hispanic population there. And I heard about the Dreamers 
uh, through one of the many internet sites that I've, I've signed up for, and was so impressed by them that I, I emailed them and, and actually had to, I almost had to interview and coerce them into, into trusting that this, this, this gabacho was actually for and not, not some kind of meager spy or something like that. With at least one million students with their future at stake, Dreamwalker Gabby Pacheco says that the root of the we new media outreach is the ourselves. desire and to emerge what, from the shadows. Know, this whole walk has been about being able to liberate yourself, to tell, you know, from your heart, you know, how you feel, to be able to allow for other people to touch it and sense it and even see it when they close their eyes. And once she shares that with this crowd, she instructs them to send a text message and join the movement blending old-fashioned organizing with the new. For Independent Sources, I'm Michelle Garcia. So we have the trail of dreams. We had uh, uh, the students arrested in Arizona. We're seeing a push for this DREAM Act to happen in the next few weeks. Marisol, uh, why are we seeing that right now? Um, well, we're seeing uh, a rise in like civil disobedience and direct action by immigrant youth um, because we're basically tired of waiting. It's been nine years since the DREAM Act was first introduced in 2001, and every year 65,000 students graduate from high school with no hopes uh, pursuing their dreams. And so this year will be another year, and so at this point we're just fed up and tired and we're ready to escalate to make sure our voices are heard. And are you hopeful that uh, the Congress will, will take this act by June 15th? We are optimistic, but we won't uh, stop. Um, there are students um, all over the country who are planning civil disobediences, like sit-ins at their o senator's offices, uh, rallies, and other actions to make their voices heard. Um, we, we're, we've been tired of uh, congressional inaction. Um, they keep pointing fingers at each other saying you should talk to this senator to push the DREAM Act, but we want them to all listen to us. Gabriel, you were in Washington uh, a few days ago speaking with uh, Senator McCain in the aftermath of the arrest of students in Arizona. Tell us what came out of that meeting. Uh, well, <clears throat> when we met with McCain, uh, it's an interesting character because uh, he f is flip flopping, you know. In the past, even during his campaign against uh, for the presidential, he said that he would support the Dream Act. And now we went and we talked to him and asked him, "Will you support the Dream Act?" We had to ask them four times to get like a direct response. And his answer is, uh, "My concern more is border security right now." So he is not really taking a side on the Dream Act and. That's the main reason why students are escalating and pushing. Marisol, uh, what kind of uh, tensions does uh, the push to pass the DREAM Act, separate from immigration reform, create within the immigration activist community? Right. So the DREAM Act has always been a separate bill, um, but it's also been included as part of a larger comprehensive immigration reform bill. Um, but in separate times, the DREAM Act has moved forward, like in 2007, it was voted by itself, um, apart from comprehensive immigration reform. And so um, it's always like a chicken or the egg question, which should go first, comprehensive immigration reform, which will cover more people, or the DREAM Act. And as students, as um, immigrant youth, we, we believe that the DREAM Act should move forward as a first building block towards comprehensive immigration reform, because what we found is that just starting, it's, it's difficult to talk about immigration. Um, not everyone, as we learned in our walk to D.C., not everyone's supportive of immigration, but they are supportive of, of immigrant youth. Um, and Dr the DREAM Act always starts conversations about immigration in a positive way. And so for us, the DREAM Act is a building block uh, for our comprehensive immigration reform. We believe it should move forward first, um, although it, it tends to be a controversial or divisive question. And another thing about the DREAM Act is that it's a bill that it has gotten this, uh, like, a stigma that's about CIR, but DREAM Act can move as a standalone bill, can be attached to the Department of Education, some uh, education bill, or can be attached to the Department of Defense bill. So DREAM Act can be attached to different bills, but it's just the whole CIR that has grabbed the bill and make it an immigration issue. 
Well, you're both of uh, Mexican descent, am I right? And when you hear illegal immigration, um, uh, you see anti-Mexican feelings uh, spurring. Um, how do you feel about that? And uh, now you have the case of a, an Iranian student being arrested, and some activists say that this could actually help the cause. Right. Well, a lot of people misunderstand that immigration is only a Mexican issue. Um, but it actually impacts everyone, even citizens. Like, I was born in this country. My parents were undocumented when they came here. Um, but I'm American. I, I returned back to Mexico, and I, I don't really speak Spanish that well. Um, and I know about other, other undocumented young people who go back to, can't go back to their country, like Mohammed. Um, Mohammed is one of my closest friends, and um, he came out during this action of being gay and Iranian. Um, and that people need to understand that immigration impacts every community, not only Mexicans. Um, it, it, it's broad. Now, does the arrest of Mohammed Abdullahi, who's of Iranian descent, highlight the fact that illegal immigration is not just a Mexican issue? Yes, I think that's really reflecting that this is not just about Latinos. Uh, this is about the whole world. And in my experience as a dreamer, I have been talking to different uh, culture students who will benefit about their dream. And most of one of the most uh, common things that I get from other students is that they are afraid to come out. They are scared. And I think Mo Mohammed, uh, he really shows like there's more than just Latinos. And this is really like a multicultural bill. It's not just focused on Latinos. And I feel like as these things keep moving, more and more different cultures will start coming out, and especially students in support of the DREAM Act. Gabriel Martinez and Marisol Ramos, thank you very much for being here. Thank, thank you. you. Now here's Abby Ushola with some other news. Thanks, Vianora. Here's a look at some headlines from the ethnic media. From the Amsterdam News, the United States Department of Agriculture, USDA, is calling for New York City to discontinue finger imaging requirements for food stamps. USDA Undersecretary Kevin Concanon says the city should take note from other states and find a less expensive method like matching names to social security numbers. New York City has one of the largest food stamp programs in the United States, serving more than 1.6 million people. City Limits reports that members of HSA, the HIV AIDS Service Administration, are threatening to sue Mayor Bloomberg if he cuts the agency's funding. The mayor proposed cutting over four million of the funding to HSA that will eliminate over 200 caseworkers. The New York City Housing Network, Housing Works, says the mayor would be breaking Local Law 49. The law sets a mandatory client to caseworker ratio of 34 to 1. In Los Angeles, Riverside County jails have begun investigating the immigration status of their prisoners in an effort to speed up deportation of undocumented inmates. La Opinion reports that 25 other counties will join the Federal Secure Communities Program run by the Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Pro-immigrant groups say the program is flawed because most of the people deported don't have criminal records. And finally, from Caribbean Life, the U.S. Congress has approved a bill that will boost clothing and textile trade between the U.S. and Haiti. Lawmakers like Charles Rangel pushed for the bill to help boost the earthquake-devastated country's economy. The textile division employs 30,000 people and makes up over 70 percent of export earnings for Haiti. Those are just a few headlines from the ethnic media. Back to you, Gary. Thanks, Abby. The pomp and pageantry of the Mexican president's visit last week belied the thorny issues of immigration, the drug trade, and violence plaguing the United States and Mexico. President Obama called the issues the shared promise and perils of being neighbors and pledged the U.S.'s continued support in combating the drug trade. However, some of the local Spanish media seem unimpressed with lofty words. El Diario La Prensa's headline from last Thursday read, Solo Palabras, Only Words. Joining me in studio are Marisa Cespedes of the Mexican station Televisa and political analyst and author Mario Nunez. Welcome. Well, thank you for having us. <laughs> Thanks a lot for being here. Marisa, how is the story being played in, Mexican, in the Mexican press? Well, pretty much um, that solo palabras. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's been a resonance 
Uh, with the reporting I've been doing, certainly uh, right after the visit, uh, there was a sense of, yeah, we like that the president stood up for us in terms of saying, yeah, we need the reform. Yeah, uh, the Arizona law is just dreadful, and I mean, politely, uh, and uh, and we need it, we, you know, and we need the arms to be controlled. But there is this sense of we're tired of this immigration reform. To hear about it, there's no action. It seems like President Obama is just sitting there waiting for what. That's the feeling I collect within my community here, and it seems like there's not an immigration reform right there in the horizon for, for anybody that I talk to. Okay. Well, uh, there's more to the U.S.-Mexico relation than immigration and the drug trade. Well, first, let me tell you that uh, always people think that in the state visits there, is, they, there has to be some result. But it, it never happens. In the state visits, it's not the, the, the matter. I think that it was a real advance that the President Obama and President Calderon show that they are in the same boat and that they are uh, rowing the same way. But I think the, the, the relationship between Mexico and the United States is much more complex than the, the matters of narcotics and, and the migratory situation. It's, it's a very strong, very deep uh, historical relationship. There's also an economic relationship that's deep and, and very significant. Tell us a little bit more about that. We are the second client of the United States. We are the second country who buy American products. What, uh, what we feel and we feel hurt of is that we are never treated like if we were the second client of the United States. We believe and now uh, the American government is admitting that we are uh, partners, we are friends, and we're neighbors. And that is something we have to realize. And sometimes it, it seems that we are mistreated in this country, and that all, all of, for sure that hurt us. We feel that is not the right way for dealing with people that is so close and that is so so friendly. We are, we are so close friends, and at the same time, we shout to each other every day. Okay, that's a good point. Marissa, you know, uh, President Felipe Calderon you know, defended uh, the work he's done against the drug cartels in Mexico, and, and I'm quoting him. He says, we are hitting them hard. Uh, Americans don't see it that way. Uh, and so what's the sentiment in Mexico? Well, the sentiment in Mexico is, uh, you know, these people have so much power because they have guns, they have money. So we need to find out where <clears throat> the money is going and, and, and why, where they're getting these guns. And obviously, as Pre President Calderon, you know, just mentioned it with, with these statistics, those guns, 80% come from the U.S. That's where they get these guns. They need to stop, they, they need to bring back that prohibition that was lifted in 2004. And I think there's a tremendous sentiment in Mexico of stop this violence. We are ruled by these, you know, drug, drug lords. It's enough, it's enough. Speaking of border control, I guess the U.S. needs to do a better job controlling the, uh, the guns coming through Mexico as opposed to the humans coming into the United States. Well, I think the, the, the President Calderon uh, said it in a, in a perfect way. If, if in the United States you don't have any control at all of really high uh, power uh, weapons, then how can you uh, ask uh, that we fight stronger? against the, 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 the narco violence. If, if, we are, if you are giving the arms, the money, more than that, my friend, the deportations, that's something that nobody said. When you are sending to our country, you know, 370,000 persons, you know, forced to Mexico every year, you are not only sending the arms and the money, you are sending the people for the narco armies. You are, you are sending the people that are going to be subject to be hired by the narco barons, you know, for the narco terrorism. That is something that you, that the United States has to understand. If you are still behaving against our workers, you know, like if they were their enemies, you are building the army of the narco, narco power. And they say they're going to raise for 400,000 this year, those deportations. It seems like it's not stopping, and I think this is tremendous. It's a tremendous issue right now as we speak within the community. Okay. The Arizona law, you mentioned it earlier. I mean, it really has been uh, galvanizing people in this country from the left, immigration advocates. How is that being put in Mexico? Uh, how are Mexicans reacting against this? Tremendously. Story? I think people are just enraged. People, I mean, we know that of the abuses, we know of the criminalization of the immigrants. This is a long story. But however, every time this tiger comes up and puts, you know, laws that are, you know, just criminalizing the immigrants, it just it's just a sparkle of anger. And uh, we heard President Calderon. I mean, we cannot accept this. 
we cannot accept it. And I think there's a lot of action taking in Mexico to boycott, uh, not only in the U.S., in Mexico, to boycott the Arizona law. You know, Mario, President Calderon is in a very difficult position in this. He's been hit from the right and from the left, uh, not being able to do enough about it. What can he do? What are his options in dealing with this issue? I think what he, he has to do is to to stand up as, as he did in the, in the American Congress, you know. He, he, he should use the same tone he did with, with, with the American uh, Congress in Mexico, which means I, I would like a president, a Mexican president, who is stronger in their appearance, not in their, in their way of government, because he is doing the right thing, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I, I believe that that was a war it has to be fought. Because there are some people from the left that are saying, oh, it was a mistake to take the army to the streets. Why? How? But man, when they are killing you more than 20,000 people, uh, shooting the, everyone to everyone, you have to do something. And the only way to answer, the real answer, is the army in the streets. I am sorry, I, I hate that, but that is the only way for the time being. And what I want is that President Calderon succeed to put all Mexicans, you know, in the same mood, to convince all Mexicans that we have to fight that war. What are the political uh, uh, for for him? Uh, for his party, Calderon, and, and fighting this war. There are obviously well, political consequences. It seems like an impossible task, honestly. As long as these people get a hold on the money and the guns, they will be ruling. I mean, it's, 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 it's an impossible task, seems to me, and that's why things like Iniciativa Merida and, and, you know, just making, you know, just some kind of uh, alliances with, uh, you know, it's especially in the border with the United States saying, listen, we are here the trampoline, you guys are the pool, the drugs are coming to you, and the guns are coming from you. I mean, what can we do? It seems like very tough. It is very tough. It is very yeah. tough, but it's necessary. It's necessary. It's a, when you, you have, what, what the narco power has are real armies, you know, they are not, they are not small gang situations. I've been comparing last week, you know, the situation in the 20s and 30s here with Al Capone and people, th things like the Valentine massacre and so on, they kill seven guys. Man. Here is 30,000. Which means the proportion, you know, between what is, was the, the struggle in, in the mafia uh, forces, you know, in the 20s and 30s, has nothing to do with this war. This is a real civil war. And then what we want about the United States is that they help us not in a greedy manner, you know, because he buried the initiative. Oh, come on. They gave us $120 million. What is that? You know, and you are sending to Afghanistan to Iraq uh, billions. Is that $1.3 $1. billion? Dollars? The real number? The real number is that they, they promise, they promise yes. the uh, initiative. a thousand million dollars, they promise. But they send on yeah. only 120,000 to 300 now, more or less. Well, nothing, nothing. Marissa, what should Washington be doing? I mean, you know, on the one hand, they're, they're, they're scolding Mexico for not doing enough. On the other hand, you're saying they're not doing enough. The United States are not doing enough. I think it's just, it seems like it's a double standard. No matter where you go, it seems to me that there's a double standard. Mm, yes. uh, I mean, it's, these are questions that, believe me, I don't know. It's going to sound terrible, but I don't know. It's like, okay, we work with one another, but then at the same time, by, by implementing this militarization in the country, we'll create also, you know, these disparities, this, um, this fragmentation, and that will create more immigration. I mean, it's just... It just, it just madness. It seems to me that it, I don't see a, a solution as we speak right now, but we need, we need to be collaboration. You know, we need, we're interdependent, and I think we need to be more gentle and more compassionate and more human. I make you an analogy. I think that the, 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 the awful law of Arizona, you know, this racist, awful story, you know, of this law that I I don't know who built this. Anyhow, they succeed to do something that, that nobody does putting all Mexicans from Mexico and from the United States in the same side. What I like is that the, 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 the war, we will fight it in the same way, all together. Yeah, but I have, a, I have a point with that. Yeah, it will be good to raise a spark to, to you know, say, okay, let's fight this. But this is a distraction to the real main issue, which is an immigration reform, an integral, just immigration reform. So, you know, what's going on? Unfortunately, we have to leave it at that.
Mario just when we started. <laughs> just when we started to the Mario page. Nunez and Marisa Cespedes, thanks for joining us. Thank you for thanks having us. Thanks a lot us. for taking us. We'll be right back. And finally from us tonight, ever heard of a corker or a leg before wicket? Well, don't feel bad if you haven't, because many Americans haven't either. The terms used in cricket, yes, cricket, the British born sport is making its way across the pond to some parks here in the city. All thanks to some expats who have lobbied the city to have the game become a varsity sport in high schools. Marlene Peralta went to Brooklyn to find out which communities are making cricket the fastest growing sport in the Big Apple. A bat, a ball, and the bowler is ready for the first pitch. No, it's not baseball. It is cricket, the fastest growing sport in New York City. Overall, you have a bowler who is like comparable to a pitcher and you have the batsman who is comparable to the hitter. Um, one of the big differences, you have two hitters in the wicket at the same time, and um, you bowl from two ends, so you don't have a mound. The sport is playing over 20 countries, nearly all of which are represented in the Big Apple. Most of the players are um, expatriates of the cricketing countries, the British West Indies, um, India, Pakistan, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, um, even now you have Afghanistan, Israel. It's these expatriates who have pushed cricket to be a varsity sport in New York City public schools. New York City program came into existence approximately three, four years ago, and it has grown as of today to 24 schools that participate in school cricket. And because of that, we have an influx of youth coming in into our, our division. The first cricket game was recorded as early as the 1500s in England. Today, it is the second most popular sport in the world, only after soccer, with almost 3 billion fans. I grew up playing cricket, and it's like that was like part of my nature, and it's like the biggest sports back home and everything like that. Back home, I'm a wicketkeeper, which is the equivalent of a catcher in, in baseball, so um, that's what I played back home, and that's probably my favorite position. Cricket was known as a gentleman's game. Players traditionally use white uniforms, and one match can take up to five days. These New York teams follow some of the traditional rules, but they play a shorter version of the sport. The 2020 is a, the, the most recent version of the game um, in order to make the game attractive to you know, the youth these days. You have to make it quick, fast, exciting. And um, each team gets to bat 20 overs, which is six balls in an over. So each team gets to bat 120 balls, and um, whoever scores the most runs win the game. Mr. Sutherland and other cricket experts hope that the game's growing popularity will translate into more pitches for playing and more funding for the sport. They hope they make cricket as popular as baseball is in the United States. This is Marlene Peralta for Independent Sources. That's our show. Thanks for watching and we'll see you again next week. In the meantime, be independent-minded.